Okay, I think we're going to begin. Um, just to give a little context about the event, uh, Chris is giving a book talk, and he's the lead organizer and founder of the Platypus Affiliated Society. Um, the Platypus Affiliated Society, established in December 2006, organizes reading groups, public fora, research, and journalism, focused on problems and tasks inherited from the old 1920s to 30s, new 1960s to 70s, and post-political 1980s to 90s left for the possibility of emancipatory politics today. Um, and if you're at SCIC, contact either Darius or I. If you're interested in coming to our events, we have a coffee break on Mondays at uh, 3.30 at the Athletic Association, and then a reading group in Lakeview at 6.15. Uh, so just get in touch with us if you're interested. Um, yeah, so just an introduction for Chris. Chris Catrone teaches in the Department of Art History, Theory, and Criticism and Visual and Critical Studies at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He is an instructor at the Institute for Clinical Social Work and was a longtime lecturer in the Social Sciences Collegiate Division at the University of Chicago, where he completed the PhD degree in the Committee on the History of Culture and the MA in Art History. His doctoral dissertation was on Adorno's Marxism. He received the MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and the BA from Hampshire College. He's also a writer and media artist committed to critical thinking and artistic practice in the politics of social emancipation. He is the original lead organizer of the Platypus Affiliated Society, an international Marxist educational project. So the book is called The Death of, Death of the Millennial Left, and I'm just gonna read real quickly the book uh, summary. The millennial left facing the war on terror, the Great Recession, the Arab Spring and the Occupy movement, and the Black Lives Matter protests, as well as the presidencies of Obama and Trump, and the political discontents expressed by Bernie Sanders, Brexit, and Jeremy Corbyn, Syriza, etc., was tasked with the struggle for socialism in the core of global capitalism. It failed to even attempt this task. In the essays collected here, spanning the millennial generation's many agonies, Chris Catrone cuts through the accumulated legacy of failures that the millennials inherited from the left of the 20th century and that blocked their view of the socialist politics needed to turn the crisis of neoliberal capitalism into a struggle to overcome capitalism. A critique of the history of the recent and current left, the book is also a lesson in politics. The politics marking the 21st century and the absence of Marxism informing the left as much as the right. It is essential reading for anyone interested in the socialist politics of freedom. So the format is I'm going to be asking some questions and then we'll open it up for audience Q&A. So you know, my first question is the title of the book, The Death of the Millennial Left, if you're not familiar with the content, might seem dismissive of the millennial left. I think as Daniel put it in the elevator, it might seem kind of harsh to the millennial left. Um, but you know, experiencing the articles being published, there was, it's clear that there's a clear investment in the millennial left as an object. So I wanted to begin with that. What made the millennial left an object worthy of reflecting on? Thanks, Omer. So I'll just say that, of course, it was the millennial left that brought me out of retirement, so to speak. So I had um, basically stopped being an activist on the left uh, at the end of college. Um, I realized uh, when Bill Clinton was elected, and when other things happened in 1992, the LA riots, um, and also the uh, protesting of Columbus, of the 500th anniversary of the Columbus discovery of America, um, kind of convinced me that there wasn't gonna be in the near future a struggle for socialism or the possibility of a Marxist politics. So I stopped being an activist. What I had done in college, I had been a member of the youth group affiliated with the Trotskyist organization, the Spartacist League, and I had participated in anti-war activism and other kinds of activism in those years. Um, so really around the time that I started teaching, um, after I had you know, gone for my PhD uh, back here at SAIC where I had gone to school as a graduate student much earlier. Um, that was in the moment of the uh, war on terror and the anti-war movement. So it was within a couple of years of uh, starting to teach here at SAIC that my students invited me to start an extracurricular reading group 
that was about like the, po the politics of Marxism rather than the ideas, which I taught academically. Um, and so I knew that in doing that, uh, that I was taking a step back into the realm of the left. Not necessarily in the public sphere, that was not so clear to me initially, um, but I knew that our conversations uh, of the readings that we were gonna do um, were going to be contentious. We're gonna you know, reanimate all the old questions from the history of Marxism and the history of the left. So because of that, I feel like this kind of second experience of leftism for me came with the millennial generation. And I kind of went through their experience with them um, and, you know, uh, committed myself to uh, what seemed to be the attempt to reestablish a socialist politics, but was progressively abandoned over time, especially by the time of the Bernie Sanders campaign. So that's what made the millennial left an object for me, you know, me not being of that generation, me being from Generation X. Um, I was able to see the millennial left come into existence, recognize uh, how it was of its own historical moment that was different from my formative historical moment. And uh, I collected my writings in this volume that were basically commentary on contemporary politics as it was happening and as it was being experienced by the millennials. Yeah, I think it's interesting to see the articles in a book because my experience was experiencing each article in a specific historical moment published in the Platypus Review or put on in a panel. And I think when we think of a book of theory, we think it's something the author has already figured out ahead of time and is then merely establishing. Where it seems like in the book, a lot of the articles are about trying to reflect on the present as a historical moment of transformation. Um, and so I wanted to ask, how did the actual trajectory of the millennial left shape maybe both platypus, but also your own thinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, so I had to not only have a second kind of political life on the left with the millennial generation, but also I had to learn things, relearn things, unlearn some things. So I had to not take my own Marxism for granted, but really try to see it through the eyes of the millennials and through the current events that were kind of motivating uh, people's consideration of what the meaning of the left and Marxism and socialism might be. Um, so it was, a, it was a learning process for me. Um, it's really the way I think about being a teacher is that uh, when I teach, I'm also kind of relearning the material through the eyes of the students. So obviously, you know, I have some knowledge going into it but really um, that knowledge is going to only be relevant or pertinent and is gonna be changed, however subtly, in a new historical moment and through the eyes of a new generation of uh, readers, of students. So in that way, I feel like there was an advantage to the experience of the millennial generation, but maybe also something disorienting and something confusing for them which is that they actually relived a lot of uh, prior history in their own moment. So the anti-war movement recalled the Vietnam anti-war movement of the 1960s and how that established a certain kind of pattern of leftist politics and leftist protest politics. Um, the Great Recession brought back the 1930s, brought back the era of um, maybe the greatest influence of the communist parties in the metropolitan world uh, in, in Europe and in the United States. Um, also New New Dealism, that was in the air around the Great Recession, bringing back the New Deal. Um, then we had, uh, due to Obama, there was the question of the racial politics of the United States. And so that brought back the 60s in another dimension, the civil rights movement, the black power turn of the civil rights movement. Um, and then finally, with Occupy Wall Street, there was a kind of return of anarchism, both the anarchism that I had some glancing familiarity with from the 90s and from the early 2000s, 
but also the deeper history of anarchism, with which I was somewhat familiar, but not terribly familiar. Um, and then the electoral uh, politics, that turn with Bernie Sanders in 2015, 2016, at the end of the Obama presidency, um, brought back uh, old history of the left in yet another way. So within a fairly short amount of time, really within 10 years, so like 2006 to 2016, uh, the millennials kind of experienced their version of what the 20th century left had undergone. Um, but again, for me, I wasn't going to allow that for myself to just be, well, I know that history, I know how this is going to turn out, so I already know what I think about these things. It was rather an opportunity to reconsider these things and rethink these things and maybe just reconstruct uh, how history had happened in the past and why Marxism had derived the lessons from that experience that it did. Um, whether through like Trotskyism, the background that I had in one respect, or the Frankfurt School, uh, the kind of scholarship that I, that I had done. Um, so, you know, I had to approach it with an attitude of openness. It wasn't like these things were ready-made and I just had something to deliver to a new generation. It's rather, I had to see how this old history was coming back anew and what it would mean for a new generation and therefore how it could mean something new and different for me. Oh, you got it. Yeah, I think related to this, you know, when I was a student from 2008 to 2012 as an undergrad, the new left was really kind of put on the table. You know, 2008 was 15 year, 50 years since 1968. Bill Ayers and the weather. 40, 40, 40. 40. Bad math, bad of math. Yeah. <laughs> um, Bill Ayers and the weather underground were in the news because of Obama's presidency. Um, so I guess I wanted you to talk about. I was 38. Uh -huh. That's why if that's you say you 50, know. I'm like, I'm like 53 now. I'm like, don't get rid of the best years of my life, man. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, yeah, so how do you perceive the relationship between the new left and the millennial left? How did the memory of the new left shape the political imagination of the, how did the memory of the new left shape the political imagination of the millennial left, for better or worse? Right, so when we first started out, which was a little bit before you arrived on the scene, Omer, um, it was 2006 when we started the reading group with Platypus, and I was living in Hyde Park. I was still working on my dissertation at the University of Chicago, and the students who originally formed Platypus came from both SAIC and the University of Chicago. So they were my students here and also there, because I was teaching undergraduates there in the social sciences core, uh, with other people who got involved with Platypus, like um, Atia Khan and Sunit Singh and Spencer Leonard and James Vaughn. We were all teaching together at that time. Um, and in 2006, so we started the reading group in the winter of 2006, so early 2006, summer of 2006, the founding convention of the new Students for a Democratic Society, like the reborn 60s student radical organization, happened at the University of Chicago. And so um, I went with the Platypus kids and we attended, you know, we, we, we saw that convention, that conference. And they were being um, mentored, the new students for a democratic society, mostly um, young people radicalized around the anti-war movement. They were being mentored by the old SDS members from the 60s. And they had formed their own organization called the Movement for a Democratic Society. And they had uh, you know, very explicitly told the younger people, don't repeat what we did, don't follow us, we didn't get it right, we weren't successful, we didn't get it right in our own time, and so if you were to take what we did back then, not only would you repeat our mistakes, but y it would be even worse because you'd be applying it to a different situation because the war on terror is not the Vietnam War. Issues have changed since the 60s. Um, and so, nonetheless, and I think Bhaskar Sankara, who's the founder, editor, publisher of Jacobin Magazine and a prominent activist in the Democratic Socialists of America, and also someone acquainted with Platypus, someone that I'm personally acquainted with and somewhat influenced by the Platypus Project, um, who was 
Young, who was basically like uh, same age as the first generation of, of platypus members back then. Um, so he had commented on the fact that there was kind of nothing between the 60s and the millennial left, that there was no left for a long time between the 60s and uh, the millennials. Now that wasn't of course entirely true, but it was also did capture something. So Gen X, my generation, hadn't really produced a left of our own. The closest that we came to doing so was in the 90s. And really that culminated with the Battle of Seattle, with the anti-World Trade Organization protests in 1999. Um, but that hadn't left much of a mark, and it, it was sort of occluded or obliterated by 9-11 and the War on Terror. So the whole like anti-globalization movement or alter-globalization movement seemed to have been uh, uh, completely uh, swept away by the new anti-war movement um, that presented the world situation in very different terms from those of the 90s. So in that respect, um, early on the millennials kind of acknowledged that they were picking up from the 60s, that they were taking up the mantle of the 60s, even though they kind of knew that they had to do things differently. Now interestingly, of course, fast forwarding to the end of the story, Bernie Sanders. Right, so Bernie Sanders is a, is a 60s radical, um, very famously. And uh, he was a little bit atypical for the new left in that he was a member of an old left organization. He was a member of the Socialist Party of America, which is the original Socialist Party in the United States from the pre-World War I era. So very, very old organization, although it had undergone very significant changes in the meantime. Um, so again, it seemed like the millennials in some ways inevitably were picking up from the 80s and 90s, but not in a way that really uh, manifested clearly. Instead, it seemed like 1968 and we're marching on from there. Yeah, you kind of addressed this in an earlier comment, but I kind of wanted to double down on it. I mean, it seemed like, yeah, the beginning of the millennial left, the new left was an explicit kind of reference. But yeah, fast forward to 2016 and Bernie, it seems like a kind of old left language of a new New Deal, socialism, Marxism, class, came into fashion around that campaign. And, and so how do you explain that shift? Is that a kind of getting serious about politics? Is it a kind of lowering of political horizons? The transition from the, early, the new left being so kind of prominent in the early moments, the millennial left, to fast forward to 2016, the DSA, and a kind of an imagination of an old left. Right. So. <clears throat> One way that I like to think about it and that I write about in the book is the changing meaning of Marxism for the millennial left. So because the millennial left was initially born in the anti-war movement, Marxism meant an analysis of imperialism. Right? So capitalism was seen as the reason for the war on terror. And American hegemony was equated with the global capitalist system. Uh, you know, again, it was a, in some ways, picking up, but not in a terribly acknowledged way from the 90s left of the anti or alter globalization movement. Um, so that's what Marxism meant in that moment. With the Great Recession, which I think did surprise everyone with the financial crash in 2008, it was not expected, um, suddenly capitalism presented itself in a different light. Right. It looked like an economic crisis rather than a political hierarchy in the world system based on economic supremacy, you know, the Washington Consensus. Um, now, interestingly, the 60s, the new left, um, was Marxist, but again, not in a period of economic crisis. So the 60s was a boom era. The 60s was an era of prosperity the New Left was even described as the revolt against affluence. Right? So in that way, Bernie, that moment, uh, less so Occupy Wall Street, by the way. I'll, I'll mention that in a second. Um, Bernie seemed to be a throwback to the 30s. He seemed like an old, old leftist. I mean, it's the Brooklyn accent. It's his whole demeanor. It's his age, right? because he was an older 
new leftist. He wasn't exactly a baby boomer. He was a little bit older than the typical baby boom generation. So he seemed to be older than he actually was. In other words, he seemed to represent a deeper history. Um, and so again, class was not a major thing for the new left, actually. Neither was it a major thing for the millennial left at first. But then it became something. And it's interesting, again, to think about how s issues of class, because that's what we usually associate with Marxism, that Marx is the like theorist of class, class division, class struggle. Um, how that figured for the millennial left, because again, maybe not, maybe not in terms of the working class, maybe rather in terms of the downward, downwardly mobile middle class, maybe in terms of um, students who couldn't get jobs after they graduated college and were saddled with high student loan payments that interfered with them having a, a middle class professional life. So, Again, the way Marxism comes back, and Marxism didn't exactly come back with Occupy Wall Street, that was more kind of neo-anarchism. Like David Graeber, for, for example, was a, a major influence on Occupy Wall Street. And Occupy Wall Street wasn't really about like the working class. It wasn't about like class in the Marxist sense. It was more than 99% and the 1%. And it was really a reaction to the Citizens United decision that seemed to uh, threaten the domination of capitalist politics by big money, by big money donors. Um, as it turned out, and really what that meant was a fear that it would favor the Republicans. As it turned out, the Democrats have actually uh, have taken great advantage of the Citizens United decision in the form of unlimited campaign um, fundraising uh, but more through small donations. So first Obama and then Bernie Sanders really benefited from the loosening up of um, uh, campaign finance restrictions and campaign funding. Um, but again, even Occupy Wall Street, which was about the economic crash and was about like Wall Street versus Main Street, wasn't about uh, class or capitalism in the Marxist sense. Yeah, that's good. So this is a very basic question um, to get at the title of the book. So what does it mean to talk about the death of the millennial left? According to what criteria can we say that the millennial left died? What killed the millennial left? And was the millennial left ever alive? Yeah, good question. Okay, so um, when we started out in Platypus, um, so it was early 2006, but then we kind of moved from being a reading group to being an organization. And what that meant was that we were gonna put on uh, public panel discussions with leftists, like contemporary leftists. Uh, and soon after we started doing that, we decided to publish um, a periodical, the Platypus Review, basically a monthly uh, broadsheet paper. And for that first issue of the Platypus Review, I wrote an article uh, whose subtitle was, The Left is Dead, Long Live the Left. Um, earlier than that, I had written some of the founding documents of Platypus, me and my friends, they consulted with me, uh, in the summer of 2006, in which a similar thought figure uh, was present. But this idea, the left is dead, long live the left, you know, modeled on the king is dead, long live the king, so uh, the idea of a, an inheritance or a passing of the torch from one generation to another. Um, what that means is that I certainly thought in 2006 that the left in my understanding, namely a um, socialist left, a left that's struggling for socialism, struggling to overcome capitalism, didn't exist, was non-existent. And uh, the socialist left that did exist, the small organized Marxist tendencies, uh, they would also say there's no socialist movement. They were trying to build a socialist movement. So they would also have agreed the left is dead. So it wasn't taken as like personally negating them, but rather the idea that as a political movement, as a political force in the world, it was non-existent. It used to exist, but it had died and it needed to come back to life. So. Again, in my understanding, the millennial left represented an attempt, again, to uh, bring the socialist left back into existence. 
The last time that that had happened was in the 1960s with the new left. So we don't usually think of the new left this way, but there actually was a movement within the new left to reestablish a socialist party. Um, in the United States, in Europe, it meant establishing a new, a different socialist party or a different communist party from the ones that existed. In the United States, it would have been the reestablishment of a socialist party that was a mass party and it had become a small sect by the 60s. So I did see the millennial left as an opportunity to create a new socialist left that had not existed for my generation. Um, so again, the possibility, the potentiality, the impulse towards doing that, in which case it would mean bringing the left back to life. So uh, I see the millennial left as a kind of abortive attempt, right? Sort of angling in that direction, but then stopping short of it. And that's what it means to say that the millennial left died, meaning it gave up its aspiration. So it's not that it had achieved a socialist politics, but rather that it gave up the aspiration to a socialist politics. I guess controversially I'm saying this because ironically enough, the form in which the abandonment of a socialist politics, the form that that took was the reestablishment and growth of the democratic socialists of America. Right, so it was millennial socialism per se that had not been announced as such previously. So I mentioned the new students for a democratic society. So again, not students for a socialist society, but students for a democratic society. The war was seen as undemocratic. The Citizens United decision was seen as undemocratic. Again, Occupy Wall Street, even though it was informed by anarchism, it wasn't really calling for anarchism, it was calling for democracy. And even uh, Bernie Sanders' democratic socialism wasn't really about socialism, it was really about democracy. It was really, again, about the 99% and the 1%. So in that respect, millennial socialism, the explicit public announcement and the high profile of millennial socialism, so AOC, for example, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the squad as socialists, I guess even Jamal Bowman is a socialist, so the original squad and the expanded squad are socialists that, for me, that apparent triumph of socialism or rebirth of a socialist politics in the United States actually marks the abandonment of, of a socialist politics in favor of a democratic party, progressive liberal capitalist politics. All right, so that's the sort of concrete, you know, a uh, sense. Uh, now, I also don't necessarily see that impulse to reestablish a socialist politics. I don't see that really continuing in, in a different way from that millennial socialism of the Bernie campaign and the squad. So you've kind of raised you know, the millennial moment as a moment of potential and opportunity, at least at a certain moment, for socialist politics. Um, you know, and also that we experience a kind of political crisis in the millennial moment. As, and so I, I wanted to ask, how did the opportunity and potential for socialist politics present itself in the millennial moment that was never made good on? What did that look like? Or what could that have looked like? Right. So again, it, it was sort of a um, grasping towards Marxism, some kind of grappling with the Marxist framework. Again, first as like understanding imperialism, understanding international war as somehow related to capitalism. Again, uh, kind of loosely, it wasn't really thoroughly thought out. I mean, obviously there was the idea that somehow the war on terror was due to the profit motives of like Blackwater or like military contractors. I don't know that that was really taken too seriously by the millennial left, um, but that was there. And so in this respect, Again, the question is, what was motivating the return to Marxism or the reaching for, for this history, for the deeper history? The Great Recession, the financial crash, um, was you know, another kind of reaching back to Marx and Marxism, including in a more mainstream way. So not only the millennial left, but even people on Wall Street were cracking open Das Kapital, like trying to figure out what happened. Right, because they actually, it, they were quite unclear as to why the financial crash happened. I mean, there were explanations. Um, there was the idea of um, 
you know, the housing bubble and this kind of thing, but people still wanted a deeper, deeper explanation. They, most, most people in the know to some extent concerned with these matters, even just capitalist economists and Wall Street people knew that that was a superficial explanation, that there, that there was a deeper dynamic at work. Um, and the millennials, for their part, also tried to um, reestablish the Marxist critique of capitalism and understand Marxist theory in this way. Um, again, Occupy Wall Street was not so much that. It was more anarchist. But I will also say something about anarchism, um, something that's less in this book and more in the uh, companion volume that will come out in January. Uh, which is the more kind of properly theory book, which is there was a phrase around the time of Occupy Wall Street in the context of the Great Recession, um, an old phrase, but it came back for the millennials, which is Marxism in theory and anarchism in practice, right? So the idea is that Marx and Marxism are good for the theoretical understanding and critique of capitalism, but Marxism is bad as a politics because after all, look, it led to the Soviet Union and communism and this totalitarian repression. And so we need to be theoretically Marxist, but practically anarchist. There was that kind of idea. Um, so now when we come around, there's a, a kind of a 2008 moment of the New New Deal, and then there's the Bernie Sanders moment of the New New Deal. By the way, the Bernie Sanders moment of the New New Deal, the kind of missed opportunity of Obama, right, um, even applied to Trump. So during the campaign in 2016, um, Trump's famous book is The Art of the Deal. He's written several books, um, but that's his most famous book. And The New Yorker did a profile of Trump, an article called The Art of the New Deal, right, in which they portrayed Trump as FDR. Right, there was, they did a little cartoon illustration and um, it was FDR in a top hat with one of those foppy cigarettes on a cigarette holder, right? Um, so looking very like dapper FDR, but it was Donald Trump. Um, so it was understood that the moment, again, first in 2008 with Obama, but that is a missed moment. The moment after Obama was also another bite at the apple of a new New Dealism. Um, whether in the form of Bernie or in the form of Trump, and also in the form of Hillary, I should also say, um, that Hillary also put a different aspect of her progressive, like Democratic Party politics forward in the context of um, the succession to Obama. Um, so again, the moment of clarification was, well, what is the relationship? What is the difference between Marxism and socialism and a kind of progressive liberal capitalist New Dealism and welfare statism? So again, the millennials did struggle with that. But I feel like Trump's election put that question on hold and it hasn't ever really been taken up again. It's been sort of quietly shelved, you know, because people understand there is a difference between FDR and Lenin or Eugene Debs, right? Uh, that's the American socialist who, poster of whom is uh, uh, legendarily on Bernie Sanders' uh, Senate office uh, wall. So I wanted to pick up on something that I think, you know, runs throughout the book. And, you know, the, the question I have written down is, is the millennial left to blame? How did past historical moments of defeat on the left shape the failures of the millennial left? I mean, are they guilty? <laughs> we were just talking about this in class today. We didn't quite get to it on my Walter Benjamin class and Kafka and Oedipal guilt, <laughs> right, and cosmic guilt. Um, are the millennial left guilty? Yes, they're guilty. Children, you're guilty. Sorry, no. Um, and or are they rather tragic victims? Right? Are they are they tragic uh, protagonists? Um, but even that might not spare them from cosmic guilt. So, um, are they to blame? Well, they look. The millennial left can be judged by their own ambition. In other words, they set a task for themselves, and they failed that task, and they abandoned the task. So it's not like an extrinsic criterion. In their own terms, they failed. And what's worse. They haven't quite confessed their failure. 
right? So in other words, they're guilty in their own terms, they're to blame in their own terms, but they're even more to blame and more guilty for not even acknowledging what they should be able to acknowledge, which is that, look, we tried and we failed. Instead, it was, well, we keep on trying. Or they say that actually their ambition was not so, so big, right? So they, they, they never really thought that they were struggling for socialism anyway. And so therefore, they can't be held to that standard, held to that ambition. But I was there. I remember. They did want to overthrow capitalism. They did want socialist revolution. They were radical, right? They might have forgotten, but I don't forget. Maybe just to push on the second half of the question. I mean, this is you know a running theme throughout our conversation. But in what ways did past moments of defeat kind of shape the failures of the millennial left? Very good, because again, the millennial it left is repeating what past generations of the left have also done. They've also forgotten their failure. Um, they've not acknowledged their failure, and instead it's become the struggle continues, right? So uh, the idea is that um, la lucha continua, right? The uh, struggle continues. Um, uh, I don't know if it's from the Spanish Civil War. I don't think it is. I think it's from the Latin American left. Um, but in any case, well, the the 30s struggle against like capitalism and against fascism is a never ending struggle because fascism can always come back, right? So that struggle continues. The struggle against US imperialism and racism and sexism and homophobia and now transphobia from the 60s, that's a never ending struggle. That struggle continues. Um, and of course the millennials inherit all of that. Right, the millennials inherit all the past struggles, and in the process, they lose sight of what made their struggle unique and different. Right, rather, they're fully willing to subordinate themselves to this long history of never ending struggle. And because the past generations never gave up their struggle or realized that their struggle might have been uh, misapprehended or a misfire in some way or a wrong direction. Um, instead, we just add to the struggle, right? We just, uh, we just proliferate these never-ending struggles. Um, it was Joe Biden who was put out there in the Obama administration as vice president, because this is the role of vice presidents, by the way, to be like in the ideological vanguard of an administration, to be like the test marketer for like, you know, trying new things. So Joe Biden was portrayed as like the pro-gay marriage like figure in the Obama administration and that Obama himself was more like reluctant. That's such bullshit. The point of the matter is Obama totally supported gay marriage from the beginning and so did Hillary and Bill Clinton even though Bill Clinton had signed the Defense of Marriage Act. Of course they all supported gay rights going back to like the 70s and, and certainly Obama from the 80s but they had to pretend that they were more conservative so they put Biden out there as like the uh, gay marriage advocate. And then after that was achieved, he became the trans advocate. And if you remember, he said, the struggle for trans rights is the civil rights movement of the 21st century. Yay. Right? The struggle continues. Right? Because now we, now we have something else to fight the right on. Right? And we have a new way in which people are fascist. Right, so um, originally you were a fascist because you're anti-communist, but then you're a fascist if you are, you know, too slow on the uptake with civil rights in terms of racial discrimination. Then you're a fascist if you're not on board with feminism. Then you're a fascist if you're not on board with gay rights. Now you're a fascist if you're not on board with trans rights. Right. So again, when we think about it. It's a formula that allows people a certain amount of historical amnesia, including about, and really first and foremost, about their own history. Yeah, this, this last question will segue well, and then we'll open it up for audience Q&A. But what lessons need to be learned from the death of the millennial left for a future socialist politics? 
Good question. The jury might still be out on that, meaning we have to see how it plays out. We have to see how a new generation might have to struggle against the legacy of the millennial left, right? How um, discontent with the millennial left, with their formulation of things, with their gambit, with their kind of final uh, gamble, which was the Bernie Sanders campaign. Younger people are, are, you know, will define themselves as a new generation of leftists insofar as they're not saying if Bernie had only won, but rather will say, well, maybe that wasn't the right thing to do, right? And so that kind of thing, I think, uh, in various domains, right? Like, okay, Black Lives Matter was a total farce. We have to deal with this issue a different way, right? That's what it will take for um, the legacy of the millennial left to be really crystallized. I mean, in other words, it's easy for me as a pre-millennial to sort of see the millennial phenomena in a critical light, but really what will matter is what comes after, right? The retrospective view on the millennial left. Because, you know, like I said, I tried my best to be open and in good faith, and I think you know, I, I did an okay job of it with respect to the millennial left, an openness to doing things in a new and different way. In the, in the face of its failure, it's easy for me to say, well, I could have predicted all that. Like, I knew that wasn't going to work. Um, so really, it will take people trying to pick up the mantle and trying to deal with the legacy of the millennial left, but finding kind of authentically for themselves the need to do something different from the millennial left for the millennial left to become a proper kind of historical object. Okay, great. We can open it up to audience Q&A at C. Hi, Chris. Um, so how do I enter this? Uh, I guess um, I received my I guess, initial political education from millennial anarchists. And so what was shoved in my face was like the kind of Maoist, like Symbionese Liberation Army uh, kind of thing. Uh Um, And that was something that was also told to me, something that you said, mentioned earlier, was that, you know, Marxism had a point, but it wasn't like militant enough. Mm. Um, so there was this weird like French communization theory kind uh-huh, of thing uh-huh, going uh-huh. on that they do appropriate Marxism in a certain type of way mm-hmm. but tactically what they'll say is they're anarchists right. and so <laughs> that was um, very confusing to me but also like um helpful in a different way because now that I'm interacting with more Zoomers who are interested in Marxism as well who might have not gotten an education at all from any not to say that my education by millennials is good Mm -hmm. but it seems that there is this sort of like cynicism to towards the millennials and how they like teach the new left or the politics of the new left um their sort of narrative in ways where they don't allow themselves to learn from even that, Mm, mm -hmm. to pick up on those failures. Too cynical. Mm -hmm. Right, even if the millennials won't tell you, like, this was a failure, right? But actually taking seriously what's being said Uh and being able to pick it up yourself. Mm -hmm. And so... Taking the attempt seriously. Right. Right. They're not even doing that. I'm I'm not trying to say that the Zoomer left is also dead at all, really. It might be the way my generation was. Right. The 80s or something. So yeah. it, I was talking about this with someone else, right? That it does feel like it, there's just like nothing now uh-huh. um, in the way that Z- Zoomers are returning to theory. Mm, mm-hmm. right? um, mm-hmm. And so my question is... Um, how uh, how do we i guess really like how how what would you say to zoomers who are trying to, who are interested in marxism and sort of have these issues with this sort of hang up 
this because it does seem that there's like this like permeating frustration towards the millennial generation mm, mm-hmm. right like you guys gave us these bad cards to deal with uh-huh, uh-huh. um and so how how do we deal with that <laughs> right so something that um i kind of anticipated uh several years back now which was that the dsa turn like the bernie sanders the democratic party turn basically the electoral turn on the millennial left would be reacted to reacted against by uh in the form of a kind of uh return to anarchism or maybe to what was historically known as left communism and communization theory is like the 60s version of or post 60s version of because it's more recent than that but it, it draws on a lot of 60s thinkers a version of a kind of left communism from the 1920s, which similarly was um, disenchanted with the Soviet Union and remained oppositional in the context of the New Deal era, like the kind of uh, alliance between progressive liberal capitalist reforms and uh, socialist and communist politics in the 1930s uh, and through World War II. Um, So again, the question is, when people are curious about Marxism, what is it about Marxism? Like, what does that mean? Because actually Marxism can mean a variety of different things. And so what about Marxism is is of interest, is um, proving to be interesting. And especially if it's, again, the theoretical analysis or theoretical critique. I would say it's not even the theoretical critique. It's more the theoretical analysis. It might even be just the mere description of capitalism that Marxism gives you. Um, You know, exploitation, class division, class hierarchy, and of course class struggle, right? Where that is, that can itself be turned into a perennial never ending thing, right? Rather than a historically specific thing that has a a point to it, you know, like in the dictatorship of the proletariat. That's not just a sort of, you know, the people at the bottom always struggling against the people at the top. (laughs) <laughs> Pardon me. So, again, I think that for me the question always has been, and what I had to be open to, and I think would now we would need to be open to with the new generation, when people are curious about Marxism, when people are interested in about Marxism, what exactly does that mean? What about it is, is attractive or interesting or provokes curiosity? Um, now, I will say about the millennial left why I feel confident that the millennial left was some kind of impulse in the direction of a socialist politics is that it actually did deal with the political question. Um, namely, you know, so I mentioned Bhaskar Sankara. Um, how did I know him? How did I get to know him? How did people in Platypus get to know him? Around the question of uh, reestablishing a socialist party. Around the, the party question, the question of a socialist politics and um, specifically the idea of like, you know, on what basis would a new socialist party have to be uh, formed? So Mike McNair of the Communist Party of Great Britain wrote a book published in 2009 called uh, Revolutionary Strategy that was revisiting this question of like, the Leninist vanguard party, socialist parties before that time, communist parties after that time, and um, like the neo, the Kautskyan, like the, the idea of going back to second international Kautskyan uh, social democracy and those socialist parties from that era, like I mentioned the Socialist Party of America in the United States of Eugene Debs was a, based on that conception of the political party that uh, Marxists had. Um, now, Again, what's interesting about that is that's Marxism in a very specific sense. Marxism as a theory, but connected to a political strategy. And in many respects, one can say that that's what theory always was for Marxism. It was an explanation. It was a perspective, a kind of self-critical perspective on a political strategy. So it was a political strategy that tried to understand its own historical context because even the political strategy of Marxism wasn't necessarily original to Marxism. It was inherited from a larger pre-existing socialist movement. 
So basically what Marx and Engels did was they took an existing socialist movement that had a certain set of political demands, but also took a certain form, took a political form, and Marxism tried to explain how that was part of the history of capitalism and how it was very much of its own historical moment. In other words, tried to be uh, kind of critically aware of its own historical possibility. Whereas now we're in a realm of more abstract principles, right? So we argue about like, democracy or centralized authority or like anarchism or hierarchy in organizations. We argue about those things now as more transhistorical like uh, abstract principles as values in and of themselves rather than as phenomena of a certain historical moment. In other words, what is it about capitalism and what it would take to overcome capitalism that might necessitate taking certain kinds of political action. Instead, it, the question is the ethics or morality or tactical viability of those actions in and of themselves, rather than thinking about how they're connected to their historical moment. At an earlier time in the millennial left, people were thinking in those terms. They were thinking, okay, so in some ways capitalism is the same, and so we have to do something the same that people have done in the past. But also, insofar as capitalism has changed and is different, we might need different tactics and maybe even a different strategy. That is no longer <laughs> being discussed, right? Um, and so I would say even like um, the communization theory and like the coming insurrection, like that kind of stuff. So around Occupy Wall Street, but also around things like Black Lives Matter, and even Me Too for Christ's sake, um, the idea of um, protests without demands and uh, movements without leaders, right? So that combination, movements without leaders and protests without demands, because both leaders and demands are the ways in which movements are co-opted or defeated or turned into their opposite. Right, so if you get rid of like leaders becoming dictators, like Lenin leading to Stalin or something, um, or if you get rid of demands that can always be taken up by the capitalist state and co-opted, then somehow you can keep the movement alive without ever having to risk, right? So in a negative sense, even that, which I, you can tell I'm not terribly sympathetic to that perspective, but even that is trying to grapple with something that now is not talked about, right? So there was a self-consciousness, like I said, to Occupy Wall Street, but also to Black Lives Matter and to Me Too. There was a very deliberate, intentional strategy involved and tactics adopted in order to prevent the defeat of the movement. Did it? No. But at least they were aware of some kind of a problem of like means and ends and what are we trying to accomplish and how do we not get co-opted or defeated? How do we sustain this, you know? Um, and again, now it's just, well, how do we pressure Jamal Bowman to vote the right way on this or that bill in Congress, you know, aid to Israel or whatever. Like, you know, like totally, totally nothing to do with Socialism. Right. <clears throat> so now that the millennial left is fully put to rest, um, in your eyes, stake to the heart <laughs> and holy water and silver bullets or no silver crucifix, something you got to do something, right? But anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> so would you consider it appropriate to keep on doing, or let me put it like this, I uh, the think the subheading of your book is interventions, mm -hmm. um, as in a doctor's interventions on a patient. So my question is, does it make sense to continue intervening in a patient who is dead? Is your project going to become an autopsy? Or will you find a new patient uh, and what would need to happen for a uh, for for you to change the object of your interventions? Okay, so 
I'll just say that um, originally I planned on publishing my writings for Platypus in 2018. So uh, in 2018, I published a book called uh, Marxism in the Age of Trump. Platypus Publishing published it. And it collected my articles and also panel transcripts of events that Platypus put on on the Bernie Sanders campaign and the Trump election. Um, so it wasn't like I edited the volume. I had a lot of my own pieces in it. But it was more like a kind of a platypus book, like kind of capturing the platypus engagement with that moment. Um, and I thought at the time that I would publish my writings up to that time, kind of compile them uh, after what I considered to be the death of the millennial left in 2017, after the Trump election. Um, so maybe prematurely, but maybe not. Um, you know, when a doctor declares a patient dead, they're not actually completely dead, right? They're just past saving, right? That's what that means. Um, you know, there might still be brain waves. There might still be, you know, there certainly is still cell metabolism going on. Um, but for all intents and purposes, dead. Now, uh, fast forward to this year when I published this book. Um, and, you know, after the Trump presidency, after COVID, which I don't write about, um, uh, into the Biden era, this is another kind of inflection point and maybe less of a deniable moment of a retrospective kind of taking stock, like, okay, what, what was this? You know, like fully in the past tense. In 2018, it certainly would have been very hotly disputed and maybe not even recognized. In 2023, there's more an availability of uh, general recognition. Um, and I think that that's, you know, authentic to its moment. It's better that I waited. Now, interestingly, this book, The Death of the Millennial Left, was not what I had in mind. I was going to publish my more theoretical writings, and I wasn't going to republish these more political writings, specifically the essays on Obama and the war on terror and um, on like uh, the question of anti-black racism in the United States. I wasn't going to republish those things. I didn't need to republish my Trump essays because they were already in Marxism in the Age of Trump, uh, the platypus publishing book. Um, so I was just going to go through my kind of writings for platypus on Marxism theoretically on that kind of thing. And so those essays don't have the character of an intervention in the way that these did, these more political current events writings did. Um, and, uh, you know, so I was convinced to publish this by Doug Lane, who's the publisher the, of Sublation Books. And, you know, he, he said that he wanted me to publish my political writings as a history of the millennial left. Right, and again, the question is, is this a moment where we can say there is this kind of object, the millennial left, but also that there is a kind of completed trajectory of the history of the millennial left that now can be considered? And I think that there is. Um, and so again, I was more coaxed into this book publication specifically by my publisher, who's a fellow Gen Xer, um, but who also was politicized in the into uh, taking Marxism seriously in the millennial era and whose oldest children are millennials. Um, and so youngest children are Zoomers, oldest children are, are millennials. Um, and so, uh, and who themselves were leftists and politicized and so he experienced things through their eyes. Um, so, I mean, we'll see. Uh, like a lot of my writings, um, I feel like I'm writing for the archive, I'm writing for posterity, I'm writing for the future. And so it could be that this, this way of doing the history of the millennial left as a running chronicle of it um, is something that can't be received now, but can only be received later. That's possible. Um, in terms of making interventions in a, like, a new Zoomer left, well, if there is such a thing. But I also thought for myself as a writer, um, which I did have to find a new way of writing. This is not writing that I had done before Platypus kind of called me to do it. So I had to kind of do a different kind of writing, not academic writing, not like art or cultural critical writing. Um, 
but this kind of weird Marxist commentary on capitalist politics kind of writing. Um, I may not return to that at all. So that was the other thing, is that I recognized that I was turning a page on my own writing and that perhaps I wasn't going to continue to write in this mode anymore. And therefore, I could put a kind of a bookend on it and publish it as such, right? That it may not be a genre that I return to, or at least that I don't foresee returning to it. I might, but not for the foreseeable future. Hey, Chris. So um, you keep saying um, the objects of the millennial left, which um, I really I find that fascinating. And um, it, I couldn't help but think immediately of the theory of objects from Balliard, how he, you know, this is more of an art object, uh -huh. right? Of like creator makes an art object and then gives it autonomy and then it's able to then create conversation within itself and then without itself. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not saying that you're like creator millennial left who's like then like giving autonomy. In some ways I was though. Horrifically, okay. horrifically I actually did shape the millennial left more than I intended to. But All go right. ahead. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's in, that was kind of my next part. That's I find that interesting. So then if you... Um, were to not think of the millennial left as an object, like how else, like would how would you relate to them differently, or would it be the same thing? I guess it's like it's like that vocabulary of object that I'm most interested in. Um, right. So I think that we talked about it in terms of like the way Omer posed the question, like is is there such a thing as the millennial left? Like what would the what would the phenomenon be? and how to take on that phenomenon as an object. Now, again, the question of its autonomy, right? Taking on a life of its own, certainly. So I'll just say something about that, which is that as a teacher, I'm aware of the fact that students are gonna take the ideas that I teach their own way. In other words, I'm gonna put something out there and it's gonna be taken up and in that sense, it's gonna have a life of its own. It's gonna have a, an existence separate from and independent of its meaning for me, right? So that's where the analogy to art would come in. There's the artwork and its meaning to the artist and then there's the artwork transcending the meaning that the artist had for it. Um, now, I'll just, because it came up and because I made my little like semi-comedic response, I'll give some substance to how I, I did create the millennial left and did shape it. Um, Bhaskar Sankara. Not only him, but also other DSAers, uh, prominent DSAers, the core leadership of the DSA, are people who either were students of mine or they were members of Platypus who were there and then quit and now are in the DSA, um, or there are other people. So basically, um, a lot of the millennial left has been not Platypus. So one of the things that happened in our history is that throughout our, our, our history, going back to 2007, there was a, a constant refrain of we want to be Marxist, but not like Platypus. Or we want to be Marxist, but not like Chris Catron. And that's been going on like, you know, almost two decades. And so I mentioned this in the book in my preface that I both unintentionally, but also very deliberately um, sought to shape the left in, uh, in reaction to me, right? So one of my goals you know, because being brought out of retirement, I was like, okay, children, we're going to get on the merry-go-round now, and I don't know how much fun this is going to be for me, but I will do it, okay. Um, that basically, I set myself the task of, if these kids aren't going to become Marxists, then I want them to become anti-Marxists. I want them to reject Marxism. And so insofar as I have been gradually convincing people over the years that Marxism actually is what I say it is, and they don't like that, they have given up on Marxism. And that's good as far as I'm concerned, right? So I literally, at a certain point, this is several years back now, I said to myself, if, I, if the only thing I do is convince everyone 
that they don't want to be Marxist, that will be good because it means there won't be this fake Marxism, right? In other words, it will be like, okay, that is Marxism and we don't want to do it. That at least it would like be a, a function of mental hygiene, right? In other words, then people could be what they were and wouldn't have to wear this mask of Marxism, right? Because maybe Marxism is just historically past, dead, and maybe there is an authentic new politics that does itself a disservice by trying to be Marxist or pretend that it's Marxist. Like maybe the Marxist mask disfigures, deforms, distorts something that is real that deserves a chance. And trying to channel it into Marxism or understand it in terms of Marxism, maybe Marxism is preventing an emancipatory politics from emerging, actually. The memory of Marxism is doing that. And so if the only thing that I do is negatively convince people, let's forget about Marxism, that might be something. That might be worth doing in and of itself. OK, I'm going to try and see if I can make this question coherent. Because um, so this whole, the whole thing about the millennial left, as from what I understand, from the primary questions that were asked by Omer, is that really to talk about the, le the death of the millennial left, it's to talk about what we have to learn from the millennial left. Mm -hmm. so, like you were saying, we're yet to know, we have mm -hmm. yet to see whether there will be a generation that will, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the same time, um, you also were talking about how the millennial left was kind of stillborn in a sense. It, it might have had uh, certain impulses, but there was already this failure of learning from the previous failure of the left. Mm -hmm. And so, so even though they had these impulses, they were already. It was already the minimal task which was to have to learn from the past was not fulfilled for those impulses to to be able to lead to something right and so then what i'm thinking how can we talk about uh, gen z or whatever it is mm -hmm. uh, learning the lessons from the millennial left if it, the problem of the millennial left really is to have not have learned the lessons from the new left which maybe was also not to have learned the lessons from the old left so mm -hmm. what, uh, mm -hmm. what are uh, i guess uh, no it's is it really about the millennial left ah uh, well like i said i think that it is insofar as um and one of the things that I do in the book is that I really try to, you know, and again, maybe new readers, more naive readers won't necessarily see this, but what I was trying to do is talk about capitalist politics in a way different from the way the left usually does, and specifically different from the way the Marxist left usually does. And so it seems very idiosyncratic or kind of eccentric, like the way that I address like the Obama election and all the kind of um, pejorative concepts of like the criticism of neoliberalism, like third way politics, like, you know, that centrism is like awful because it's some kind of bipartisan consensus that keeps capitalism going and this kind of thing. And really just try to think outside the box of all that kind of usual leftist analysis and often under the rubric of Marxism, this kind of way of looking at things. And, you know, again, part of my aim there was to say, look, you, you know, new generation, you are trying to do something. And so the question is, can you clarify to yourself what it is you want, what it is you want to try to do? Now, again, insofar as, like, maybe, like I, I mentioned the movement for a democratic society, the 60s radical veterans who were advising the new students for a democratic society. They weren't saying learn the lessons of our generation in the sense of like, you know, they said don't do what we did. But also maybe you're trying to do something entirely different, right? So in other words, maybe 
superficially, it looks like the same thing. You're participating at that time in an anti-war movement. It looks, therefore, like the Vietnam anti-war movement. But maybe this war is different, and therefore maybe your opposition to this war is different, and maybe the movement in opposition to this war has to be different. So it might just be something else. So it's not like, okay, they had to learn the lessons that hadn't been learned before by previous generations. The fact that they had to try to do that is itself part of the problem. Right? In other words, it was like, okay, we want to do what the 30s did, but this time get it right. Or we want to do what the 60s did, but this time get it right. Maybe it would have been better for them to just forget all that. To just not be under the specter of, didn't people try this already? Maybe what the millennials were trying to do had never been tried before in certain key respects. Now, of course, for me, the issue of Marxism is, it might be the same thing that people have tried to do in the past, but maybe the past that one has in mind is actually much longer ago, much deeper than the 1930s, like the Great Depression era, or the 1960s New Left era. Um, maybe what's being repeated is actually a deeper history that's completely unknown, that's completely obscure, that's you know, very esoteric. But again, like that's one way of thinking about it, that it's a deeper history. Another way of thinking about it is that maybe this is something entirely new and maybe the past is just inhibiting, right? So it's not that I was saying you must learn the lessons of the past and this time you have to get it right. They were already doing that. That, that was already the mindset. I was saying maybe you don't know what this is that you're struggling with, right? So thinking about like Bill Clinton or Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders, people who are like to the left of the Democratic Party, people who are more centrist in the Democratic Party, people who are more conservative, maybe this whole way of thinking about things, about the significance of things is wrong, right? Because it is ultimately like a kind of popular front, like Stalinist kind of, I would say, framework for thinking about like the right and left of the Democratic Party. Maybe that whole framework is totally at odds with what they were trying to accomplish, in fact, like the actual substantial social and political change that they wanted. That's one of the reasons why I'll just say this, you know, um, you know, like Marxist, but not like Chris Catron. Well, definitely when I seem to have come out in favor of Trump, it wasn't that, it was rather, don't be an anti-Trump maniac, don't be Trump derangement syndrome. But people took that as me, oh, he's for Trump, ah. That also, and also saying Trump's not a fascist and this kind of thing, that maybe this just isn't what you think it is, right? So again, the whole framework that's adopted on the left, but also within mainstream capitalist politics. And what's interesting is how those have really come together now. So the left used to talk about fascism all the time and fighting fascism, and you never heard that in mainstream politics, really. Now in mainstream politics, it's all about that. And so, again, just the idea that maybe you should forget this history. That's another aspect of it, right? Rather than this time we should get it right. This time we should learn the right re lessons. Because actually, it's not like um, the 30s and the 60s, it's not like the older left, it's not like that history has clear lessons. It actually does not, right? So that's the other kind of point that I would make, right? And so similarly, I'm not sure that there are gonna be clear lessons from the millennial left. You know, there might be like an obvious lesson, like don't be a Democrat, but like that's again, not saying much. And also it may not even be right, right? In other words, it might be be a Democrat, but in a completely different way than you're thinking about it, right? Um, or be a Republican, or it might be something entirely different. Um, but again, there is a history to consider, but there are not clear lessons to be sort of given. That's the hard part. Because, you know, if it's just a checklist, like do this, don't do this, you know, if it was that simple, we would be in socialism a long time ago. It's not. 
Any last questions? Uh, Chris, uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, the 10 years from 2006 to 2016 was sort of uh, mm -hmm. amalgamation of things that s mm -hmm. at least reference the past events. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, also to add to that, like if I extend it uh, to 20 years and like from 22, going back to 2002, to add to that a, a new nuclear uh, threat and what seems to be a, a revival of uh, the mm -hmm. Cold War rhetoric. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you explain this intensified character of capitalism and what is uh, going on? Why these events seem to uh, happen all at once mm -hmm. within one generation? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, And so, is it a new phenomenon? What, what I mean is, mm -hmm. does it give them uh, a new character to these events? Mm -hmm. The fact that they all happen at once. And also, mm -hmm. how does the left uh, recognize them? Right, whether it does. So, I mean, I guess I would, you know, maybe start with like an easy kind of Marxist description which is to say World War II came at the end of the Great Depression, and now World War III seems to be coming at the end of the Great Recession, right? Um, that would be an available narrative. That would be an available like understanding or explanation. Um, and I'm not sure that people have quite said that yet, but they've at least edged in that direction. Like I think that that already is on the minds of people on the left. Um, it's almost like they don't want to say it, but they also want to say it. Now, obviously this is a new situation. This is a new situation. It's different from World War II. It's different from the 1930s. Um, you know, uh, the Soviet Union was a different thing than uh, Russia is today. It was a different thing. It had a different historical significance in terms of like uh, European politics and society. You know, the Soviet Union, there were mass communist parties in all the Western European countries in the 1930s. Um, you know, similarly, World War I was very much about, like, stopping socialism, like in Germany. Like, the, the German government definitely saw starting a war as a way of defeating the socialists in their own country, and that was the country that had the strongest socialist party. So obviously, that's not what's going on now. Um, that it would be fanciful to say that, I don't know, Putin invaded Ukraine to stop domestic political op opposition. Or that um, Biden and the NATO countries, you know, the United States and the NATO countries under Biden's leadership are, you know, launching a kind of crusade against Russia to stop political opposition within their own countries. Now, from a certain paranoid standpoint, it can look plausible. It can look like, oh, well, the yellow vest protests, and so, ah, right? Or the um, Alliance for Deutschland, uh, AfD, the AfD in Germany, like this right-wing populist movement. Um, maybe this is what's like causing the EU and NATO to, to you know, set up an external enemy. Um, and maybe to stop Trump, you know, Biden has to fight Putin from a certain paranoid standpoint, and maybe even in their own thinking. But I don't, I don't think that those are the actual historical conditions. I don't. But I wanted to put that out there as a kind of plausible, some kind of a quasi-leftist kind of understanding, some kind of like world history, geopolitical moment. I would say rather that the best way of understanding this kind of history in capitalism, like great power conflicts, geopolitical chaos, um, is it's better understood as a symptom of capitalism. In other words, it really is the case that of course a major global economic downturn as we just experienced since 2008 has had ramifications, has had a politically disruptive effect, both in the core major capitalist countries but also in other countries. And maybe in other countries, in more peripheral countries, it has a more dramatic impact than it does in the metropole. It seems to have had a dramatic impact in the United States, 
but again, I wouldn't want to understand that positively. I understand it rather negatively, meaning Bernie and Trump were obviously symptoms of a crisis of the major capitalist parties, like their inability to do politics as usual, to conduct electoral politics and even policy um, implementation as usual. Like there was an impasse, there was a crisis that has taken place. Um, but I think that has less to do with a deep social crisis of capitalism and more to do with a kind of brittleness and ossification and weakness of the capitalist political order, meaning it's much more conjunctural, that there's no particular reason why the two parties, the Republicans, right, who are, are also devolving into chaos now, right, they just uh, unseated their own um, majority leader in the US Congress, uh, Kevin McCarthy as Speaker of the House of Representatives. Um, there's no particular reason why these parties have to be as chaotic as they are, right? There's no like deeper historical necessity, but it does turn out to be the case that they are weak and that they are kind of fragile and that that threatens a great deal of political chaos, um, you know, next year, right? Um, and you know that the Ukraine war is gonna be a major factor in the US election, it already is. Right, it's the only thing that distinguishes the Republican candidates among them is Ukraine war policy. So there are some pro-Ukraine war policy, there are some anti-Ukraine war policy candidates. Um, but again, I wouldn't wanna give that, it might be the case that under the surface, the United States is quite stable. And it's only in the ruling cliques, it's only in the political parties, it's only among the politicians that it's chaotic. Right, it could be that actually society is fine, it's stable, but it's just the politicians who are messing up. Um, and I see war that way too. In other words, I don't see war as necessarily driven by deeper historical necessities. I see war as the realm in which mistakes can be made right, in which people can take risks, can have gambles, and can fail. So the way I understand the, um, the Ukraine war is I think Putin made a mistake. I think he gambled and lost. I think he lost already. Like I think within the first couple of months he lost. And that now we're just dealing with how deep that loss is gonna go, right, and controlling the loss. Uh, that's the way I see it. I could be wrong about that. But one of the reasons why I see it that way, so I might be wrong in this case, is that again, I don't see uh, war as a zone of like historically determined necessity. I see it as the realm of politics and a very risky realm of politics, um, but one in which actually there's enough scope for errors and blunders Right, there's a lot of latitude for more contingent circumstances rather than just the expression of some deeper historically determined necessity. So that's the difficulty, right? So in other words, uh, could we have nuclear World War III by accident, by historical accident? Yes. Can we overcome capitalism by accident? No, <laughs> right? So yes, like a lot of uh, harm and, and destruction and death can come by mistake. I do think that that's possible. Like that's the way I understand history. Um, now what comes after that, what people do in that circumstance, what they make of it, that will maybe, be, like the aftermath of it, that might be more conditioned by historical necessity, but the events themselves, not necessarily. That's the other thing to keep in mind. So I do have an article in the book on the Ukraine war and um, that article kind of annoyed people on the left because I seem to not care. I seem to be like, oh yeah, you know, capitalism, war, yawn, you know? And people are like, what are you talking about? World War Three, ah, nuclear weapons. And I'm just like, yeah, you know, might happen, right? <laughs> and what are you talking about? So uh, unfortunately that's the case. We could have nuclear war by accident. Uh, I was also wondering about the 
intensified character of, uh -huh. of all that like all these events that you mentioned the new deal and etc and uh, mm -hmm. overall it does seem to happen within the span of 20 years and so it has this so here's a condition here's a weird conditioning factor um so what do they say about russia that it's gas station with nukes have you heard that expression russia is nothing but a gas station with nukes Right, so if the world moves in the direction of uh, no more automobiles, right, and even electronic cargo ships, right, then Putin won't even be a gas station with nukes. He won't even be able to maintain his nukes because he won't be a gas station anymore. So he might be looking at things as this historical moment is the last historical moment that Russia can preserve itself from being broken up in the long run. Like, we, get, we, we have these resources now that we may not have in the future, and so we got to, you know, establish the borders, the boundaries now, right? Otherwise, it will just be this, this inevitable, inexorable, like, uh, downward uh, trajectory. So, um, you know, so, like, Green New Dealism and, you know, it global warming and, you know, climatology, whatever, might spell the end of a power like Russia. That's one thing. The other thing that I'll say is China. The, you know, the Great Recession, China had a way of staving off the effects for a long time, maybe no more. In other words, it might be that now China is really gonna be impacted in a way that it can't prevent, that it can't save itself from, in which case it might find itself in a position where it has to do things now before it can no longer afford to do them. That can happen too. Um, so, you know, again, that's gonna be up to decisions, right? Like that's not, there's no like guiding hand of history that's gonna force anything. People are gonna make decisions and they could overreact and they could make mistakes. Um, so in many respects, what you're talking about the last 20 years um, we're still feeling the effects, and there, th many of those effects are still yet to come, I think. Right, so, uh, you know, in other words, the crisis that began and that really was contemporaneous with the millennial left, that crisis is not over. The millennial left might be over, but the crisis that gave birth to it is not over, and furthermore, the effects of that crisis are not fully felt yet. So in the book, you mentioned that there has not been a, the left has been stuck in conservatism like significantly since like the 60s. Mm. And also you mentioned the 30s, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the New Deal. Um, and that in this time, we have a different need mm -hmm. for, uh, just like politics in general. Mm -hmm. But also you mentioned like in the 60s um, when the U.S. was rebuilding itself that Europe and Japan was rebuilding itself. So I, I guess like with the new needs that we need now in the U.S., like how does that look to you in terms of like global rebuilding as well as That's us good rebuilding question. right now. So I was actually just in an interview um, with um, a woman who's a political science professor in Kansas, Lori Johnson. She has a podcast called Dust Bowl Diatribes, and she's like a Christian socialist, a uh, Catholic uh, Christian socialist. Anyway, um, and I was recalling in that conversation, in that context, and it hasn't been released yet, but it will come out soon, the podcast, um, do, you, do you know that Trump has a kind of a program for the 2024 election, which is to build 25 new cities in the United States? Yeah, model cities. Um, and I mentioned in that podcast, and I'll mention again, uh, and of course I'm forgetting the guy's name yet again, as I did in the podcast. There's a guy who wrote an article called The Case for Colonialism. You know, he's an American historian. He might be Canadian-American. 
Um, he was on Douglas Murray's uh, Uncancelled History podcast, talking about his article and his book and his perspective. And so he thinks the third world should be developed by the metropolitan countries like Japan and South Korea and the United States and, and Europe, that they should be setting up charter cities, model cities in Africa and Latin America and the Middle East. Um, in other words, that they should do another wave of colonialism to develop the third world. Um, and so this is like a, a, a potential program that you could have another world boom based on a new kind of infrastructural like project, both um, in the United States, but also abroad. Um, so there's that. I don't, know, I don't know what that amounts to, whether what the resources for that are. Um, you know, again, it's raised by the question of like the um, infrastructure act, right? Which was turned into this other thing because now like we're in this funny bureaucratic realm of language. And so like human infrastructure as opposed to physical infrastructure because physical infrastructure is like a straight white male thing, but human infrastructure is like a women and people of color thing. Ah, and then they also talk about like neurological infrastructure, that the internet has to develop the neurological infrastructure, which means it needs to like operate on our brains a certain way. Like the, the tech people actually talk about this. Yeah. And so we need to invest in the neurological infrastructure, right? Um, to have the economy that we need, right? Um, and this is facilitated by concepts of neurodivergence and that kind of stuff too. Um, so, but get, getting back to the model cities idea, the pilot cities idea. In other words, maybe cities like Chicago are just past saving. Maybe they're just totally decrepit and all this money has been poured into them to kind of keep them afloat. But maybe what needs to be done is just start new cities in wherever. All right. Um, build it and people will come. Um, you know, there are possibilities for the renewal of capitalism, right? So one of the things with the millennial left that dogged it is the idea that this was a terminal crisis of capitalism, that the crisis of neoliberalism was the end of capitalism per se, that this was like a crisis of capitalism that couldn't be recovered from. Um, and they had all sorts of explanations for how that might be the case. So. I think rather that uh, the crisis of the Great Recession era was an opportunity for, and the depth of the crisis and the ongoing character of the crisis is actually an opportunity for a greater rebuilding of capitalism than has been possible since World War II. So basically there hasn't been an opportunity to rebuild capitalism perhaps on this scale since World War II. Um, but maybe also the neoliberal era itself should be reconceived of as a form of the renewal and, and massive rebuilding and expansion of capitalism. So in a place like the United States, it's easy to say, okay, well, the cities went into decline after the 60s, and then they were rebuilt starting in the 90s, and now they're kind of going into crisis as a function of the Great Recession. But you could, if you expand outside of the old like uh, legacy cities and the, that kind of framework, you could also, also see how the United States was developed in a completely new way since the 60s, right? So in the South, I mean, there's ha there has been a lot of development. And also like the exurbs, like the suburbs that aren't the traditional 50s suburbs, but are sites of production and, and commerce. Not, that are not just bedroom communities. Um, so again, a, a lot of ways that the left thinks about these things are actually blinding to what's really going on at the level of society and, and capitalism. And so that's the kind of uh, caveat that I try to put out there, which is to say that we're not even, like in the usual leftist ways, we're not even necessarily looking at the right things we're not looking at the right things, we're not looking for the right things, we're not paying attention to the actual dynamics at work. That that's what it means to be stuck in a past framework. Um, so you brought the question of conservatism, 
right? So that's the real essence of the conservatism of the left or why the left is dead as a left. It's not only dead as a political force, but even, even in its outlook, in its general historical kind of understanding, it's backward looking. And in that way, it's conservative. So you could say that starting in the 30s, there's a kind of fight the right idea, fight fascism, fight the right. Even the Cold War had that character of like fighting the right. Um, and certainly in the neoliberal era since the 60s, since the new left, the new left, when it gave up on its ambition, then fell back into a kind of, well, okay, we're not going to accomplish what we set out to accomplish, but now we have to stop the right wing reaction against us. And certainly in my lifetime, that's what the, the legacy of the new left was for me. It was the new left radicals becoming the principal activists in defensive struggles, in fighting the right, in anti-Reaganism. And we can see that now with Trump, that Trump has provided that opportunity of saying, yes, Obama was insufficient, and yes, we wanted to do more, but now we have to hold the line and prevent any backsliding, right? We have to fight the right. Now, what's interesting is that the Biden administration, this era, has seen a progressive push. So the Biden administration has, has kind of incensed the Republicans because it has actually sought to be more progressive than the Obama administration had been. It has pushed a more explicitly progressive agenda. And again, the left has been sidelined by that because that progressive push has not come from the millennial left and it leaves the millennial left in this kind of uncomfortable position of not knowing what that is and whether or how to support it. Uh, and so even in that context of a kind of Biden administration new progressivism, the left per se still seems to be in this kind of defensive posture. You know, Anti-fascism on the one hand. On the other hand, insofar as it is part of any kind of organized labor struggle. It is about unions going on strike now, like the UAW workers or the, the railroad strike, against inroads that came out of the COVID crisis and that came out of um, the inflation, right? So it's less a progressive struggle than it is a defensive struggle. It's, it is a kind of conservative struggle. Um, now, within that context, certain progressive demands and policies might be forwarded, um, but I think the net, it will be considered a success or a gain if they just hold the line, right? If they just hold the line, if they just kind of preserve things. Um, so again, it gives this kind of uh, a deeply ambiguous character to, you know, because uh, again, a lot of what, and you know, there's also the further question of a lot of what is called progressive is of course from a socialist perspective conservative because it's about conserving capitalism, right? Um, the danger there when I put things that way is that it sounds like I'm a worstest or an accelerationist, that somehow I'm against like saving capitalism because I want capitalism to like collapse and you know and be as bad as possible because that will motivate the struggle for socialism. That's not really my perspective either. Um, again, the 30s, stands as an example of something that was a defensive struggle, ultimately, that was a change in capitalism, but that also takes on the character of apparent progress. So it does look like the working class, capitalism in general, looks like its conditions were improved after World War II than before World War II. That seems to be the case. And what is sidestepped there is the question of whether the struggle for socialism was in a better position after World War II than it had been previously. After the New Deal versus before the New Deal. That question is sidestepped and really occluded. Um, I think similarly, we're in that situation now. Again, why I would say the millennial left is dead is that it's not looking at things in those terms. It's just trying to figure out what's progressive within capitalism which again is gonna be um, a question of how best to conserve it. 
I think. So I had a question because it seems that some of the themes that are coming up are the sort of what we talked, what you talked about earlier, like we seem to be talking about ethics and, mm. um, you know, moral like questions, mm -hmm. right? And this is mm -hmm. why the question of liberalism is also taken up by the Zoomers today. Mm-hmm. Um, like what is liberalism? Mm. Do we need like the mug takes up like republicanism? Mm -hmm. Um, do we need like it's a, a Marxist lib unity group? Right. Yeah. Um, like do we need a liberal democracy? What is democracy? Is would the dictatorship of the proletariat be democratic? Um, and so my question is, and you also bring up the issue of progress, mm -hmm. right? And how, um, the millennial left is dead because it seeks to conserve capitalism without actually admitting that that's what it's what doing. It's doing. Mm -hmm. Whereas maybe perhaps the movement for social and would, would admit that there is like a sort of conservative character to what it's attempting mm -hmm. to do, which is mm -hmm. save society from mm -hmm. destroying itself mm -hmm. in order mm -hmm. to overcome the situation. Right. So with all of this, uh -huh. right. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, the question of, of, of liberalism, right? Like how it's brought up today, it seems that there is this sort of two-way attack coming w from the Zoomers, but also like uh, the Zoomers as like anti-liberalism, like we, we, right? But also from like the millennial left mm. too. Mm -hmm. And so it seems, it, it seems to be coming from a sort of confusion um, about all these things that I mentioned. So here's a kind of a legacy. So y earlier you mentioned like um, communization theory and you also mentioned like Maoism. And of course those are very different things. I mean they had some connection maybe, but they still were quite different things in the 60s in the new left, I like the French new left. Um, so one thing that we do inherit a bad legacy of the 20th century is a kind of uh, Stalinist assumption, I would say, which is that um, certain things have to be sacrificed in order to get beyond capitalism, right? So, in other words, the dictatorship of the proletariat is some kind of sacrifice of liberal freedoms in order to uh, advance the cause of socialism. You know, just commonsensical. So, um, you can't want to keep all these liberal, like, you know, liberties if you want to overcome capitalism because, after all, the main beneficiaries of these liberties are the rich people and the capitalists, right? So, you know, we live in a society of, I don't know, free speech, but really the only people who have free speech are the capitalists, and the rest of the people don't have free speech effectively, and so, therefore, they don't need to defend free speech because all you're doing when you're defending free speech is you're defending some like wacko fascist right wing rich people like Donald Trump um, and you know you're basically uh, serving his interest even though you think you're serving popular interests uh, in effect you're you're doing this kind of ideological work on behalf of the capitalists so there is this kind of long-standing idea that um, well, a very long-standing idea is the idea that um, freedom and equality are in opposition to each other, right? That if you have freedom, if you have too much freedom, then you get inequality. And in order to achieve equality, you might have to sacrifice certain freedoms. That, that's a deep one, right? Because how do you show that that's not necessarily the case? Right, it's such a assumed, intuitive framework that people have that it's very difficult to to address head on, right? To um, because you'll get into like free speech debates, for example, where people will say, "Well, you need freedom of speech and freedom of association in order to struggle for socialism," right? 
In other words, where the right is seen, you know, the, the, the right to free speech, not the uh, political capital R right, but one defends civil liberties because we need them instrumentally to accomplish what we don't want to accomplish. But then the idea is, well, once we accomplish what we want to accomplish, then we won't need these things. We only need them for this purpose, for this reason. So we defend free speech until the revolution, and then after the revolution, we revoke free speech in order to put down the reactionaries and win the class struggle and achieve socialism. That would appear to be the lesson of the 20th century, right? That in order to achieve equality, you have to sacrifice freedom. So how do we argue against that? It really has to do with how one defines socialism. And again, this is where I would say, even if we're not necessarily going to be Marxists in the future, still there might be some lessons from Marxism, from old, old style Marxism, not from like uh, 20th century Stalinist, communist Marxism, but rather from Marx and Engels, right? The very definition of socialism itself, like what is the problem with capitalism? Is the problem with capitalism that um, there's inequality? Or is the problem with capitalism rather that there's unfreedom? You know, and that there's not only unfreedom for individuals, but society itself is not free, right? To take a different direction. Um, that's where you get, like, so I, I'm thinking of like a DSA writer, Ben Burgess, Right, so he says, well, no, the left also has to defend freedom, but it has to attack capitalism as a limitation on freedom, a limitation on freedom of the working class. Because the working class has to work long hours for low pay, and having low pay and having to work long hours means that they don't have as much freedom as the capitalist class has, which, you know, they have enough money, enough time enough resources to exercise their freedom. The working class might formally have those freedoms, but substantially has no opportunity to exercise those freedoms. Again, that's where the old Marxist idea is something seemingly that no one would be interested in and yet needs to be remembered, which is that the capitalists are not free. In other words, that the problem actually is not that the capitalists are free and the workers are not free. The problem is that the capitalists are not free. Um, and, you know, it's their unfreedom that actually impacts the working class. So that's a difficult one. And maybe we do have to go through this uh, phase of capitalist restoration and capitalist reform and capitalist rebuilding in order to show that, okay, the billionaires have all these plans, model cities, neocolonialism, techno-futurism, they have all these ideas, all these plans, and they're not gonna be able to do them, right? In other words, to show the limitations of the ruling class, to show the unfreedom, how they're dominated by the needs of capital. Um, I don't know that that's gonna be clearly presented to people. I'm not sure that at any point in history that has been clearly demonstrated to people but it was the, the original Marxist understanding of the problem of capitalism, right? So, um, you know, and I think that uh, the revisionist history regarding things like the American Revolution is also perfidious this way. Um, you know, it's quite damaging in that uh, the idea is that the US Constitution and liberal democracy and, you know, this kind of thing, that it was set up to only benefit the straight white male property owners, including slave owners, like rich people, the ruling class. It was, it was their freedom that was enshrined in the Constitution and not the freedom of everyone else. All right, so there's that idea. And I think that that is a, a deeply distorting and problematic obstacle to a proper understanding of things. Um, so that a priori, uh, people on the left, I'm not sure that like, I mean, working class people are pretty much cynical about everything, um, but people on the left, right? Like middle class intellectuals, like my kind of student type people, like they have an excessively cynical attitude and negative attitude about these things that I think is unwarranted and is really a kind of resentment towards the ruling class 
because these are people who think that they would do a better job if they were in the position of the ruling class. Like that essentially their gripe with capitalism is that they're not in charge, right? And again, they have a very instrumental attitude towards these rights. Anything that helps them in their struggle to take charge against the people that, that are in charge now, they'll support. Anything that seems to help the entrenched power against their attempt to take charge, they'll be against. Right. Um, <coughs> so, you know, I mean, the millennials basically thought Elon Musk taking over Twitter was a bad thing, right? Why? Uh, because exposing the lies of the COVID policy doesn't help them work their way up the bureaucracy doesn't advance them in their academic careers, doesn't set them up to be a dean or a provost of a university, right? Because if you say, you know, the COVID policy was all bullshit, then that's the end of your career. Yeah? So it just doesn't help them to have Elon Musk do the Twitter files and expose these things. If it did help them, then you know that they'd love it. Right, it is kind of like that. So we are, you know, to get back to the issue of tactics and principles, I think people are very unprincipled, very unclear as to principles and have an inability to stand on principle and understand that principle and tactic are separable, different things. Right. Cool, I think we have to wrap up. Um, we'll be going to Exchequer after yeah. this, um, which is down the street. If you'd like to buy a book, contact me right uh, before you leave and I can help you do get, get a book. Um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, we, can't, we just can't do that on site. Right. So. All yeah. right. Thanks, guys.